glad to be here and I want to say that you should interrupt me each time you feel you, you yeah. want to ask a question. Yeah. Don't hesitate. So, yes, Sungo has chosen the topic for me. <laughs> so I'm talking about matrices and independence as they show up in the context of graphical Markov models. And that thing doesn't work. As I said, what do I do now? Ah, it does work. I have to be more... P oh, sorry. Okay. I have to give four lectures and I plan to illustrate the different types of structures that can be expressed in terms of what is called directed acyclic graphs using just very simple types of variables namely those that are most similar to Gaussian variables, symmetric binary variables. Then I'll continue with more complex motivating examples from observational and intervention, intervention studies. And then I turn to the more detailed things regarding properties and matrix operators and their properties and what this is good for, namely tracing pathways of development. And I claim that this is... <laughs> okay, so I want to start with some very general remarks, not yet connected to the special topic. If you, need it. you think that's better? No, no, no. Oh, I see. No, 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 no. So, statistics is a relatively young science, especially if you compare it to mathematics. In mathematics, there is a very general agreement on important basic results. We are not yet that far in statistics. In mathematics, proofs continue to be improved over many years. Oop, aha, that's why it didn't work. Now, take this little old example, the theorem by Pythagoras. And uh, now we know there are about 400 proofs available for it. And one goes back to China, one to India, and a third one, let you, I don't, yeah, you should tell me afterwards whether you have seen those. And the third one goes back to the ninth century in uh, Arabia. So very different ways of thinking are typical in different backgrounds, in different cultures, and that's why it's good to move occasionally, to learn and be open to different ways of uh, thinking and presenting things. So, yeah, in statistics, we certainly have also complex tasks, but they are more diverse. We have to understand first the research questions that are being asked in other fields. We have to help designing empirical studies, formulating and evaluating models and methods of analysis, and then interpreting the evidence that we can find in data and using the results of statistical analysis. And I think this is what makes the field of statistics, our field, such an exciting one. So now what I want to start with is what we call a binary distribution of concentric rings. Don't be surprised that you have never heard about it. It isn't even published yet, but it will be submitted in the next few days. So what do you see? You see a graph which has five outer nodes and one inner node, L. And it's called a star graph because it looks like a star. And what I want to show you is the distributions generated over such a star graph really can represent concentric rings as you see them on the right. There you also have an inner node, something where everything starts, and then you have equal distance rings. And these can continue, become larger and larger in the same way as the, the outer nodes can become larger and larger and that the same dependence of each outer node on L, here indicated by rho, we have to tell you later what it is, 
is the reason why that graph, that model represents concentric rings of equal distance. So I'll try to introduce this very special distribution now to you. It is a family of binary random variables and we denote the outer nodes by A1 to AQ and the inner node by L. It is I denoted by L because models of that type have been used in statistics under the name of latent class models. In that case the inner root isn't observed and called latent. Here I will say the inner node is a root and the outer no nodes are the leaves on my tree, on my special star graph. Each variable has equally is taken to have equally probable levels, so that they are symmetric. You have probability one half, one half for each of the two levels all binary variables can have. Then the Q outer nodes that are in statistics called response variables because arrows point to them have a single common explanatory variable, also called the root. As you might have suspected by the picture, unless you know already what graphical models are, the graph on the left represents mutual independence of the leaves given the root. And so that is what one of the features of this very special distribution of binary random variables. And then you saw on the graph the same measure of dependence of each leaf on the root and therefore each response has the same dependence on the inner node or the root. Now we code variables by 0 and 1, the levels, or by minus 1 and 1. And the 0, 1 coding is known in psychometrics as baseline coding. And we just count the number of ones, so it doesn't matter whether you use the 0, 1 or minus 1 coding, to give you the joint distribution. It is uh, very simple because it just has a single parameter, alpha, and I tell you later what it is. And it has a normalizing constant which just sums up the values you have on the right. So for minus one, one coding of the levels, this is known in psychometrics as effect coding, the symmetry of each binary variable implies, means, that you have zero mean and unit variances. So these very special binary variables are standardized variables. And so when we compute the covariance, because the means are zero, it's the same as the expected value of the product of two of the random variables. And then you see appear this alpha and the rho. The rho was in the star graph and the alpha in the definition of the joint distribution that I gave you just on the last slide. So they are very simply related to each other. But note that independence, the first time I mention precisely what independence means, and more important will be later on conditional independence. So we have independence of a response or of just any binary variable that is symmetric in the minus one one coding. If this alpha is equal to one or equivalent, the co simple correlation coefficient is equal to zero. And what we will do is only consider correlations that are positive in most instances because we have a single parameter. If the rows in my star graph are all zero, then uh, I have a degenerate model. It's of no interest. And negative things are not of interest for the concentric uh, ring where I want to represent the distance among the rings by rho. So, can this still be read? Yes, in a small room like that it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> so I take my uh, two by two table of a response and just one other 
a variable that I also call a signal sometimes. So you have one variable, the explanatory variable, that sends a weak or a strong signal. And the response is that you miss or succeed. Now on the left you see the general definition of the elements in the 2 by 2 table, the contingency table. And on the right you see the special case that occurs when the two variables are both symmetric. And that of course means that common measures of dependence also have a very special meaning. So very common for measuring dependence among categorical variables, especially binary ones, is either the odds ratio for success, the chance difference to succeed, or the relative chance for success. And if we have this very simple type of 2 by 2 table, these uh, three measures relate to each other in an extremely simple way. And in addition, there's a very special interpretation of the correlation coefficient that we call the <coughs> cross sum difference. It appears later, later on again. And another way of writing the joint distribution is in terms of the correlation coefficient. And the levels of variables 1 to Q and L. And L is a level of the latent variable, the unobserved one. Okay? So, now we not only have mar um, symmetric variables or marginal symmetry, but also joint symmetry. When we generate a distribution in the way I have defined it for you now. So take for instance p equals 3 so that you have one inner node and just two leaves. Then you see the symmetry in the representation of the transpose of a vector of probabilities in a particular order. The order is so that the first levels of the first variables change fastest, then the second and then the third. And then you see directly for in the expression for the joint probabilities, the joint symmetry, which means you can switch the levels of any leaf combination. Take 1, 0, 0 and change it to 0, 1, 1 and then you get exactly the same probability. That is the joint symmetry we are looking at here. And what is particularly cute is that you can see already from four variables how you can build the joint distribution in an extremely simple way. We have, if we have just a single variable, well, so we have the number of cells being two, I have alpha power zero. <coughs> one half, one half are the probabilities. So the first line is nothing but saying I have marginally symmetric variable. If I have two variables, I take my alpha null and add to it something of the same length but increase the power. And then I keep going. At that stage I have these, I take them again, increase the powers and then I have the larger distribution. And if I have that, I take it again for an additional leaf in my star graph and add to it the same alpha with the power increased. And you keep going. So it's a very simple, cute structure that this star graph model has. So maximum likelihood estimation. Given the observed frequencies for any pair they're of symmetric variables, um, binary variables at sum to n, mm. we can write it also in a vector, in a row vector like here, and then the estimate of rho, the maximum likelihood estimate, is precisely what we saw before, the cross sum difference. It's something that has appeared essentially nowhere in the statistical literature so far, that the correlation coefficient 
turns in that special case into such an extremely simple measure. And we call it the cross sum difference of the two variables involved. And now if we continue, it can be shown that if you want to estimate rho for any q number of leaves, then it's just the average of the cross sum differences of each leaf with the latent. More interesting even is, but I didn't have the time to really do that explicitly and I want to concentrate on other things, is that if you, if L is unobserved, typically in latent class models, in any model where you have latent variables, things become more complicated. But for that particular model, you can, for the first, you get the cross, you get the average of the two, of the um, cross arm differences of the observed up to three outer nodes or leaves. Then you need, in general, um, an iterative procedure to solve the maximum likelihood equ uh, equations, but when we use the expectation maximization algorithm in that case, both steps can be written in closed form and they reduce even to a single updating equation for the correlation coefficient. And remember what is the most beautiful property of maximum likelihood estimates? Well, in my view, it is that once you have a maximum likelihood estimate and you look at any other one-to-one -one transformation of it, be it like here in just for a single, single estimate or in a much larger system with many parameters, when there are one-to-one -one, uh, transformations between the two sets of parameterizations and you have the maximum likelihood estimate of one, then you also have, by the same type of transformation as it happens to be true in the population, the estimate of the other. And that is a beautiful property of maximum likelihood estimation that is sometimes lost nowadays when people invent new methods that are computationally feasible, nice for many variables. Each leaf is of the same size n. The leaf? Yeah, each leaf has the same size n. Uh, some it says uh, uh, some to n. Yeah, my, 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 I have a two by two contingency table. Yeah, n is the total sum of the observations. Of the observations. And what about for each leaf? For each leaf. Uh, I mean, okay. Let's go back here. Here's my two by two table. Mm. And I now get any observations, n0, 0, 0 n1, 0, and so on. And you take the cross sum mm -hmm. that defines in the population the correlation coefficient. And if you have instead of probabilities, you have uh, yeah. Yeah. counts. On the last page, on the last page. Yes. Yeah, if you go back to the last page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. The, the, so the last one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that one. Yeah, that one. On the last line. On the last uh, line. On the last line, the, when you compute the, the sum of the C, uh, cross sum differences, and uh, what happened to the n? If your row hat is... Well, I have a total sample of total size sample n. n. Yeah, oh, okay. sorry. Okay. I didn't define that properly here. Yes. Yeah. Of course, we have the same number of observations for each leaf and the root. Ah, I see. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Yes, thanks for asking. So, this was a very simple model that has very attractive features actually because one can also use it to show something interesting about the three types of measures of dependence. The odds ratio has become the measure of dependence for categorical variables. But in many different fields like in epidemiology the relative chance is being used or in causal modeling the risk difference is being used. And you can use this particular model to show when you exchange the role of explanatory variable and response, making the explanatory variable the dependent 
and the other, the, the, the deep handed, just changing, exchanging it for, a, uh, for three variables. You can show it very simply. It is only the odds ratio that stays constant, whereas the uh, risk differences appear to be much reduced, can appear, or, and the relative chances, the thing that is still the standard measure of dependence in all epidemiological studies, increases enormously from very small, near one, to very huge, depending on the number of leaves you have. And this shows the danger, the possible dangers that you can have in different uses of these measures. This may be in, in interpretations that are causal, where you take often differences. It may be when you use a propensity score, where you try to condition on as much as possible, and if you happen to condition on something that is not an explanatory variable, but really a response, that is the, the actual cause for introducing bias. Mm. Okay, so this was the latest uh, model that we have been developing and as I told you it's not yet published. We haven't even submitted it. So the joint distribution more generally of binary variables that are symmetric uh, we have studied in a bit more detail. It's more general than the star graph. It can be any directed graph or even um, joint response graph um, and this was published a few years ago. And these joint distribution, I, I try to give you an introduction into graphical models using the particular simple um, representations that are possible with these symmetric binary distributions. And just note that this uh, distribution that we are using relates to what is known as Bahadur's expan expansion that had a little error in it that was corrected by my colleague Streitberg who died much too early but he proved, he corrected the old um, expansion and he proved existence and uniqueness not just for the special distributions that we are looking at but in general, for general types of densities. So. We speak of a linear triangular system with exclusively main effects. When we have a triangular system for four p equals four variables, I show you the triangular type of such a system. So you start with a variable A4 at, that has levels L and it's symmetric, so it has probability one half, one half. Then at the next step you have A3 depending on A4 and some parameter that I explain to you later describes <coughs> the dependence of A3 and on A4 and so on. And you keep building it up as a tri and we call it a triangular system because similar systems have been studied in economics and for Gaussian variables and also called triangular systems by Hermann Wold many years ago and these are the, the analog uh, for the simplest type of binary variables. Now the interesting thing is that here the measures of dependence are just linear least squares regression coefficients in the population for these binary variables and all these variables have mean zero and unit variance. Hmm. No. What's happening? It's, it's sleeping. Yeah. The machine is sleeping. No, no, no. <laughs> Why try to wake it up? <laughs> no. Did it uh, not? It didn't work. What happened to this? You haven't pop up. What happened to this? <laughs> Maybe it didn't take all? Where is the... Uh ah. No, it should have more on it. Okay. No, that's what we had uh, this moment. 
Okay. So, again, in the system we have uh, uh, we have these parameters in the triangular system, and they relate all in an extremely simple way to Pearson's correlation coefficient just computed for binary variables. So, if we have just three and four, two variables, the measure of dependence is, as I had shown you already in the concentric ring model, it is just three, four. It is a correlation between these two variables, three and four. If you have two, they are the linear regression coefficients as you would compute them for standardized Gaussian variables and so on. And it then has the special feature that the joint distribution is essentially totally described in terms of the two-way margins. What has often been forgotten in papers by Bahadur and followers is the higher order interaction effect which has to be there so that you get a joint probability. So these um, models do not have the beautiful feature that log linear models have where you can, that, that are hierarchical, you can systematically set parameters to zero. That is not possible with these types of models because then you get outside the zero one range. So for four variables you need the four factor interaction, for uh, six, the six factor interaction and so on. And in that model I, I use my math. Yes. Uh, is it uh, like... A, is the levels, level, level, level is, uh, minus one, one. Oh, minus one, oh, one, ah. Yes. Oh, we do minus one, oh, one, oh. Yes, we always use minus one and one now, most of the time, because that gives us a nice feature that we have mm. standardized variables, mm. so that everything reduces to the correlation matrix, not even the covariance matrix. Mm. Mm. And that makes things simple. Okay. Um, so, so now I start showing you the different types of structures and how they are represented for this special type of binary family of distributions. And I just use simple examples most of the time. Here are four variables. You have mutual conditional independence of the three variables, the outer variables given the inner variable. It's called the inner variable because it's a common explanation for the outer variables. And, uh, oh yeah, the H should disappear, it should be an A. Anyway, so the H change it into an A, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it is a triangular de uh, decomposition of the concentration matrix, the inverse of the correlation matrix in this case, when the variables are all standardized, and they give you the uh, things that you need and want. So, in particular, when you just look at the correlation matrix, it looks complicated, relatively. Especially if you don't know there is structure, you just see everything is non-zero. But if you know the force variable is a conditioning variable, then things show up as a simple structure. And if you go back and compute this product, transpose a diagonal matrix times A, then you get again a structure that has um, the same type of zeros as you find it in the triangular decomposition. So are you wondering, for instance, why we have 1, 4, 2, 4? Well, we have mutual independence. And if a what is a partial correlation? Between 1 and 2, it is 1, 2, minus 1, 4, 2, 4. Mm. So if the partial correlation is 0, and it has to be for these models for conditional independence, that is a structure that you see in the correlation matrix. Under the previous model? Under this model. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. How did you get, uh, how did you get A? 
The usual uh, uh, Koleski factorization, ah. triangular decomposition, whatever. Ah. I use my, my matrix operator for it that I introduce for to you later. Okay? But it's just uh, standard. We know that for every positive uh, definite symmetric matrix, uh, there is a triangular decomposition. So, here is a totally different structure, also only simple for four variables, and it's much better known as a Markov chain. It's a single graph of arrows pointing from the root to the final response. The root is here the variable 4, then you have an intermediate variable 3, an intermediate variable 2, and the final terminal response 1. Again, when you look at the correlation matrix, whether it is in a Gaussian case or for these binary variables, you see, unless you are experienced, very little. They are all known zero, and if you look at the triangular decomposition, it has now this banded, uh, banded feature in the symmetric inverse, and in the triangular decomposition you have many zeros because just 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 and 4 are the variables that are dependent as you see it in the graph. Mm -hmm. And we say sometimes that the more complex structure that you see among the pairwise dependencies result because you don't know the structure mm -hmm. you have done under conditioning. So if you condition 1 on 2, 3 and 4, then you see the structure that results over there because the graph, as I tell you later, implies that 1 is independent of 3 and 4 given 2 and 2 is independent of 4 given 3. So by the spectral decomposition of the P inverse, <coughs> if you look at the A matrix only, yeah. you can see the structure. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. For single response variables. And there is an equivalent, I have to tell you later on precisely what a Markov equivalent model is. The previous page, if there is no arrow, yes. just edges, what happened to the A? Exactly, here it is. Like this one. <laughs> that is one of the a typical, we have the general result that when you have a directed acyclic graph, in, 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 in case you know this, uh, notion and there is no configuration of that type that is called a collision 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 V it's a V because you have two unconnected nodes and it's colliding because you see two arrows pointing at the same node. so whenever you have a particular type of graph and none of these configurations, a directed acyclic graph, and none of these configurations, like you have it here, there are only transition config Vs, no, nothing else. Then you can just take away the arrows, get a totally different model, namely a log linear model, typically. Mm -hmm. And in that particular case now, um, it also has a nice representation in terms of the regression coefficients that I described before. Actually, they are all correlations. So, the general factorization when you see a Markov chain is in written in terms of densities, where I always use a very conten condensed description in terms of nodes. One you have a joint density of four variables, one, two, three, four. One depends only on two, two only on three, three only on four, and there is a final marginal density for four. So if we go beyond these special binary variables, that is what we would see for a Markov chain. Now let's turn to a different type. Now we have undirected edges as I call them, many others draw them as bi-directed edges, but I prefer undirected because in the Gaussian case it just shows the um, elements that are zero in a covariance matrix. And here, because the covariance matrix and the correlation matrix are identical, the zeros show up 
in indeed the correlation matrix of these binary variables. Again, if such a structure is in your data later on when you study data and you do not look at your covariance correlation matrix, then you won't see the zeros. You if you do the triangular decomposition, because somebody told you triangular decompositions are very nice and useful and easy to interpret, they become a mess here. That's very <laughs> strange. <laughs> no, it's not strange. It is what we call standardly over conditioning. <laughs> so, so that graph means... Uh, it just, oh, you just see the marginal structure. bivariate dependencies. What you look, what the, the dashed line just means Look at the two variables that are connected. Mm -hmm. Do they have bivariately, just marginally, a dependence, yes and no? If there is none, then it shows in the appropriate measures of dependence. And they are, in this case, for two variables, the simple correlation coefficients. And interestingly, this model now is equivalent to something much more complex that we call, that has been called, Zellner had invented that name in the Gaussian case. We have two seemingly, un, uh, seemingly unrelated regressions. One explanatory variable, which one is it? Two depends on one and three depends on four. And if this were not here, well, we would have two separate simple regressions. But once there is a remaining association among these two responses, estimation and testing gets ugly. Seemingly unrelated, that's the simplest case of it, unrelated regression. It's called seemingly unrelated because this dependence, it, if you look at the graph, okay, this depends only on that, this depends only on that. And indeed, many years it was used and not understood in econometrics. It was uh, Hot, um, Havel Moore, who in 1943 wrote a paper and pointed out that in linear regressions, not binary variables, standard quantitative measures, uh, this poses a problem. You need more complex uh, estimation procedures. And uh, he, he got the Nobel Prize for recognizing this in 89, for this particular recognition, for this particular status of a seemingly unrelated regression. Actually, the name was invented by Zellner in 60-something. But Havelmore already in 43 described it in terms of linear equations and how the simple separate estimation procedures fail if you have that structure in the population. So if you, if you re-express that one using marginal association yes. model, then two and four are... Independent. Connected, connected no? Well, yeah, three and four, two and three are connected, look. Three and three, three, two and four are connected in, ma in marginal association group. Yeah, yeah. So, here's a zero, here's a zero, and there's a zero. Uh, there are zeros, by the way. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because this is an extension of the collision node for the models that I will introduce to you. When you marginalize over that, this is, a, this is what, it, what remains. And the dependence for a multivariate regression is indeed the, for each component taken separately on the explanatory variables. So, a little bit more general, I like to speak of data generating processes. Uh, and I use that term sometimes in a way that is similar to what other people call causal models but I do not want to speak 
of a causal parameter, a causal model, or something else, because I think causality is a very important concept that motivates much research, but no parameter, no model become causal just because we give it the name. It may have little nice properties that make it more easily interpretable, but I don't use the term causal. But if we have a sequence of that type, a marginal, so we have d variables, it doesn't matter which type of variable, discrete, continuous, um, binary, many levels, if we have just d variables, and we also don't worry about the distributional form at this point, we just write, we start with the density of the last variable, then generate the dependence of the next variables given that last, and so on. Then d minus 2 depends possibly already on two variables. And then finally, the response of main interest may depend on all. So this is a process we can always write down. It doesn't have any independence constraints. So it would correspond in the graph to a complete directed acyclic graph. Each node is a response except for D, and it depends on possibly everything that is in the past. So then we have a notation for the corresponding directed acyclic graph. And much of the literature on graphical Markov models is only concerned with the graph and the independences and not with a dependent structure. Whereas I'm convinced, having worked for more than 40 years with different substantive researchers, that it is the type of dependences, the direction of dependences, that are of main interest to substantive researchers. The independences may simplify our interpretation a lot, but they are after the type of dependence that explain structure. So we call that a directed acyclic graph, and the abbreviation is a, a correspondingly a DAC. It has a node set n from 1 to d, so you remember how many variables there are in the system. And there are only arrows, namely directed edges, that connect any node pair. And the graph is called acyclic because if you follow, you start at any node in a graph and you follow the direction of the arrows, it's not possible to return to the starting node. So <coughs> then there's a standard notation that you call the node from which an arrow starts, the offspring, no, the parent, and the node where the arrow ends, either the child or more generally the offspring. And then you have a, have a set, when you have a big system, then the set of parent nodes gives you those variables that are important to explain the response i. So remember, I'm at the moment just talking about responses that are single. Yeah. Do you want to I can take a break? Yeah, yeah, wait, let me do. Yeah, 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 we can take a break here. So let me just uh, give you that last uh, mm. thing here. We have densities generated over the uh, graph. They factorize in that way. For the last node D, we don't have a parent because it has no incoming error. And all others, you have a single response depending on a set subset of, set of the things that are in the past. And then it has become common to say the, generate, the joint density has been generated over this deck. And if there is no error, then for each single response, you immediately have the interpretation. This response is independent of everything that is in the past that is not apparent. And you write it compactly in the notation that was introduced by Phil David a few years ago. Okay. okay, let's have a break. Okay.